For more than 25 years, director Sir Alan Parker has led an acclaimed and diverse career with such films as Fame, Evita, Mississippi Burning, and Angela's Ashes. In his latest, The Life of David Gale, he tackles one of the most controversial issues, the death penalty. I am pleased to welcome the director, Sir Alan Parker, to this table, along with three of the film stars. Kevin Spacey, who portrays David Gale, an anti-capital punishment advocate who is sitting on death row. Laura Lenny, who plays Constant Haraway, the woman whom Gale has been convicted of murdering. And Kate Winslet, who plays Bitsy Bloom, the reporter who tries to save his life. Welcome, one and all. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Tell me why this project, start with you, Ellen, was so appealing to each of you. What was it about this story and uh, this script? Well, for me, um, uh, I mean, I didn't think, oh, you know, is there a, a movie that I could possibly make about the death penalty? I actually, it started with a screenplay. It was written by Charles Randolph, a first-time writer, and the screenplay, when I read it, was uh, very rare coming out of the Hollywood system, and it was quite intelligent actually very intelligent. Uh, it was about something. Yeah. That's also even, even rarer. <laughs> uh, and it was a terrific thriller. It was a fantastic human drama. Uh, and it was about something important that I cared a, a great deal about uh, with regards to the political issue within it. So to be able to fuse all those things together to make a film that could possibly find a wide audience was really, for me, why I jumped at it. What would you add to that, Gabe? Well, you know, when you're an actress and you read something like this, you literally can't believe that you're lucky enough to have this material in front of you. And I read it at a time when I had just had, I just had a baby and I, it, she was about four months old and I really hadn't been reading anything at all. I'd been completely consumed by this bundle of joy that had been given to me. And I read this script one day and I just couldn't believe how how clever it was. It was a very clever script and to me it was always absolutely a thriller and it had the right twists and turns yeah. and, and, and suspenseful things that you ask of and you want as an audience um, from any decent thriller and the fact that it had a political undertone um, in this way just kind of up the ante and up the intelligence level of the movie um, and obviously Alan Parker's name had been mentioned and you know I was yeah. a fan of Bugsy Malone and I wanted to be a kid in fame and, and I just thought I'm going to I'm going to get myself this job it's the last thing I do so um, lots of stories about the death penalty why is this different well because it, it, for me and I, I think all of us would agree you know it doesn't set out to be a sort of pro con argument or the right. death penalty movie and, and I thought that the, the character of David Gale went through so many um, I mean the, the emotional terrain that the character uh, goes through w w just was filled with so many interesting uh, things to, to be able to play as an actor. On top of which, if you even take where you've started, which is the subject, I if you look at Alan's work as a director, I mean, he has always been driven toward, whether it's by accident or, or because this is something he cares deeply about, toward stories that have some degree of social injustice that he's grappling with or some political center. Except that if you look at Mississippi Burning or, or Midnight Express or even The Commitments, he always manages, because he's so skillful, to make the politics subversive to the emotional life of the characters. And so it doesn't become a polemic or a banner being waved in your mm -hmm. face or I want you to think this way. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think if this film has any message, it's decidedly muddled and unclear mm. and mm. difficult and you're kind of groping ambiguous, with it at the end of the Kevin, film. Ambiguous. Ambiguous. Yes. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> 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 the word muddled in your mind. <laughs> Did I screw don't up? Don't worry. I would, I would have said you muddled as well. Yeah. Don't worry. But, but I think it, that, that means that you're, you're following a drama and you're not... I mean, look, good politics makes bad theater. So right. I, I felt we were in very good hands with, with him. Let me take a look at this. This is a scene on the way to prison. Bitsy, Kate, explains to her intern, uh, Zach, who's played by Gabriel Mann, why she thinks... Gail is guilty. Here it is. Kelly. What is this minimum demand for you before you'll make a movie? Uh, extraordinary amount of masochism looking at all the work <laughs> that I've done. <laughs> <coughs> I just know I'm, uh, it's more and more difficult to do this kind of film. There's no doubt about that within the whole Hollywood system. I happen to have the belief that actually film can uh, entertain people and involve people and also it actually can say something. And uh, I don't work in a world for nine people at some cinematheque. If I'd have sta stood on, a, on this chair and did a political diatribe, no one would listen to me. So it's important to find a wide audience, and it's important, important to have structure that actually, um, like a thriller, 
and the human drama, which is hugely important. And within that, to have another edge, actually, is what I've always, uh, always looked for. I, my mentor, friend, Fred Zinnemann, the great director, said to me, you know, it's an amazing privilege to be a film director. You should pinch yourself, you're so lucky, and then you shouldn't waste it. If you, you should, anyone who's a film director should have something to say. Yeah, cherish the moment. Yeah. I think so. Uh, but do you find it increasingly difficult to find the stories that you will be allowed to tell? I think so. I mean, I think that uh, it's, it's more difficult within the Hollywood system to, to do good, thoughtful work. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. As they go headlong into, you know, trying to squeeze the maximum amount of bucks out of the biggest audience, it's, it's a business and, and uh, yeah. you know, I don't blame them for it. It's really ironic. Everybody goes, I always think everybody goes loony about the Oscars, you know, at this point in time every, yeah. <laughs> every year and you think, it's, you know, so much attention is given to so few films. And actually, 99% of what Hollywood does actually is not part of those films mm. and it's a great tragedy they don't do more of them and it's, it's a shame there's actually mm. so few films that actually get into contention but i've had one actor after another come here and directors say that this has been a terrific year for a lot of very good films whether they've yeah. received oscar attention or not a few films that actually get into contention but i've had one actor after another come here and directors say that this has been a terrific year for a lot of very good films whether they've yeah. received oscar attention or not i think that uh, it, you know that that film got the attention because you know there are certain people, uh, stars of movies, who fight for the film and the director, and I think Michael Caine did a lot for that with, in that regard. But I think that, uh, no, that was a film that could have been dumped. Almost was. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Almost was, because it, after 9-11, yeah. there was some sense they didn't want to... It should also be said that, you know, Universal Pictures made this movie. And this is a studio that's made its bread and butter on big sequels and XXX and, you know, they got the Hulk coming out over yeah. the summer. And so it's an example of exactly what a studio should be doing. You take all those profits you're making and you put some of that money into films like this that are provocative, yeah. that, are, that are more difficult. Uh, you put them in the hands of a director as skilled as Alan Parker, mm -hmm. and that's what you ought to be doing with that money. Because otherwise, we're going to lose that audience that's out there. I, I believe there is just as many people out who go to those cineplexes. And I think some of the theater owners ought to think about, you know, screen eight should always be reserved <laughs> for films that are, are, that, that are difficult to find right, an audience. Right, and I right. tell you, if you did it, it might take you a year and a half to build an audience, but people in that community would know. You know, you can always see something yeah. on screen eight that's and, great. And make them yeah. a half price of what everything else was, you know, and say this is a place where, you know, come here and, and, and develop an appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it'll happen? Well, when Alan and I start running a studio, you absolutely... <laughs> well, you know, you're reading all these management books now. You're running the old Vic now. Yeah. I mean, you know, any day I look for you to say, uh, I'm saying goodbye to an acting career because I, I'm into moguldom. Well, you know, the, the, the thing about the old Vic is, you know, I think there's some a misperception about how many movies that one can do in a year. You know, you're lucky if you find one good mm -hmm. film a year. And this so even it. if I'm yeah. at the old Vic for, you know, start, I'm going to start in 2000, you know, you're lucky if you find one good mm -hmm. film a year. And this so even it. if I'm yeah. at the old Vic for, you know, start, I'm going to start in 2004 yeah. in the fall, even if I'm there for six months out of the year, you know, one good movie. You know, but you're lucky if the you can find schedule. one good movie to make. You are. You're absolutely lucky if you do. Mm -hmm. Lucky for you to see something you really love. To see? Yeah. I mean, to know, to be offered something you really... To read. To, to read. read. To read. Today. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, but no, so yeah, there, there are lots of things that I will, I will though take a chance on, even if the material is not up to up to snuff. If there is a great actor involved, if there is a great director involved, if it's a part that is that I would learn something from, I'll I'll think it's worthy and I'll do it for mm -hmm. the experience of it. Um, of course, I'd like to do the best things time sure. after time after time, but in order to be, and I'm a bit of a workaholic and I like to work. So I'll work on things that even, are, I know we're not golden. I right. know they're not. That's okay. If there's something in it that is worthy, even just something, mm -hmm. or if I'm going to learn in the pro thing, mm -hmm. or if I'm going to learn in the process something, you bet I'm there. I sure. think she's also yeah. talking, too, about the, sometimes you take jobs that even though you know it's not the pinnacle for yourself, yeah. they're transitional jobs. They're, they're bridges to something else. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you have bridges, because, you know, if we could all just keep climbing up to the next plateau, oh, no, you why can't we'd do all that. do it? But no. you can't do it. It's not possible. And it's like it's, the, the more you do, the more you learn. Yeah. I mean, just... Yeah, and, just it's, it's, and it's so much... I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, th I think I'm speaking for all of us when I say that, you know, 
as 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 actors and actresses, it is so exciting to take risks. It's so exciting to take risks. And I know in in my own career, I've I've had opportunities to do that time after time Was after time. Was Iris a risk? Iris, ev look, you know, everything is a risk. It's foolish as an actor to walk into something and think, oh, this is a, this is this is going to be a hit. This is going to be a success. This is going to make me more money. This is going to get me nominations. You know, it <laughs> this just, is going to be Titanic. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, you 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 can't. I don't think as actors you can think in that way. Um, and certainly, I never have done. And I knew walking into something like this that, you know, to work with Kevin and Laura. And even though Laura and I didn't shoot a thing together, I'm honoured to be in a, in a movie with her. Yeah. Oh, you know, okay. well, it's true, babes. You know, <laughs> it's absolutely. Absolutely true. Um, it, it's about learning and evolving and changing and hoping to, yes, better yourself as an actor, but at the mm -hmm. same time, open yourself up much more to learning. And you have someone like Alan, who mm -hmm. is a great team leader and a great educator in the movies that he makes, and he's a great, he's a great handholder too. And I felt tremendously liberated throughout this process when, you know, I'm sure I can be really annoying when I turn up at work and say, now look, this scene, no. you know, how are we going to shoot it? Because I think blah, 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 blah. And sometimes he would let me run with an idea that I, I could tell he didn't necessarily think was going to work. But, and, 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 and that's, that's all as an actor you can hope for is that, you know, your ideas will be appreciated. And, mm -hmm. and, and you also have to hope for is that, you know, your ideas will be appreciated. And, mm -hmm. and, and you also have to have the willingness to listen to your director and trust that he's going to do the right thing by his vision. Such safe hands, you know? Mm. Yeah. So when somebody comes in in the morning and says, look, I've been thinking about this and I think this character. Don't start with mm -hmm. me. <laughs> there's, there's also a I remember I was in a jail cell. I was behind glass. I, I had very little to say. There's, 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 there's a big difference between actors who play the roles they're offered and actors who pl who play their careers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, there are actors who really will who they're just playing their career. They're not playing the role they're offered. I think you know. For, and that's interesting. Yeah, I know. The thing about directing is, and there's a lot of nonsense actually, you know, that's written and and spoken about it, is that okay? I could. Uh, take Kevin, Kate or Laura off at any moment in time and you can have a 30 minute conversation, I could put my arm around them and walk to the corner of, of the stage and everything. The truth is that no director ever in history ever got a performance out of a, an actor that wasn't already there. Yeah. The truth is that no director ever in history ever got a performance out of a, an actor that wasn't already there. Yeah. I don't manufacture it. All I can do is to create an environment possible so that that gives them, and it's amazing, all good actors, these three around being uh, very typical, they can feel if actually it's the wrong shot even. Even if they don't quite know, they are sensitive to that because they see and what you do and it's, uh, why should they give their all at that moment in time if they're not quite sure, are we going to do that again? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be another angle or whatever? And I think that, you know, there's a lot of nonsense that, that's spoken and, and, and written about. Directing. Yeah, but I mean, Kevin, speak to this. It is a director who we can open up that that can open up to let you allow that performance to come out that's in there. Yeah, if you, if you trust, I mean, f fundamentally, you know, take the example of, of, of the relationship that Laura and I had to develop in this film. You know, you just can't, in, you know, you can't fake that. You know, you either look into your fellow performer's eyes and trust them. And even Kate and I, who had a pane of glass between us, by the mm -hmm. end of our five days, that glass didn't feel like it was there anymore. <clears throat> you have to be able to be willing to know that you're you're going to be protected and that the way in which a performance is being guided you know you try to show up every day at least i try to show up every day and give the director as many colors as he wants mm. now he's going to make the painting i'm not yeah, yeah. i'm just providing all i'm like a vessel yeah and and ultimately you know because i don't go to dailies and laura doesn't go to dailies except maybe the first day i don't know if you go at all but there's a good reason why not to <laughs> yeah. there's a very good reason why not to first of all you don't fall in love with moments right and think ah take five and if it's and not that there was the then, one. Yeah. then you go see the movie a cut of the movie and you know why didn't you just take oh, five yeah, <laughs> that's number one and number two it makes the experience of watching the movie for the first time or maybe the third time when you can actually start seeing it as a movie um it's a, it's, I have no idea what he used. I have no idea yeah. what take it was. I have, I have no memory of it except that clearly he was able to go into editing and to craft a performance because of what he needed or the editor mm -hmm. needed to make that performance uh, make a three-dimensional human being. Use the color analogy. Do you, are you looking for a color or do you want to have three or four colors that you can take with you so you can decide which color you need when you put your movie together? I think that... Uh, 
in the end, I have to have to you if, if you want me to use the same tired metaphor. Yeah, I know. No, <laughs> in the end, I'm there right. all the way it was through. Space's metaphor. Yeah, right. know, sorry, space is <laughs> pathetic. He's muddled and I'm tired. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Pass the bar. And now I'm going to be. The table. <laughs> no, muddled. I will now be. All right. And uh, the finished painting. Yeah. Um, is supposed to be in my head, in that I'm the one that is there from the very beginning to the very end, mm. uh, the way in which this film was constructed. And you know why you cast each character to play each role? I should, and if you've done that correctly, then probably you'll get the right movie. Yeah. Because if, you've, if, you've, if I've miscast it, then how uh, brilliant I might be, it's irrelevant. Yeah. And you but cast them for a specific reason, you thought beyond appearance. Well, I mean, yeah, I'll just say very briefly that uh, these are three actors first and they might be movie stars second yeah. and that's not always the case and uh, I kind of do my homework and uh, this happens to be a very intelligent piece which I could not do with people who don't have the chops to do yeah. it so yeah. of course you know I mean that's the most important thing for me the difference yep. the, the thing about Alan and 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 it really is what puts him into the you know the realm of the great directors that, that we are lucky enough to have around is that you have the sense every single day he is completely in control of the story but he doesn't try to control you. Mm. And consequently, there's a freedom that then happens because you know that he trusts you. You also know that he's right on it as far as telling the story. Mm. So that you can, you can sort of just relax a bit because a lot of times you'll have directors who don't do that. Either they don't really know what story they want to tell, so pages get rewritten and scenes get messed around and hair colors are changed, and, um, or they try and control you. They're overly, um, they're nervous, and so they try and tell you what yeah, to do. They shoot so. the heck out of it because they have yeah. no idea. They don't know what they're doing. You're doing 13 different <laughs> angles, and you're like, what yeah. the heck is going on? Yeah, because he doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. All right, roll tape. This is a scene, because I want to get to this notion of the transformation you go through in terms of determining his guilt. Uh, roll okay, tape. Here it is. Okay. Am I? I know. That's your reputation. Oh, but this is so it. Good. I was just sitting there. I, 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 Every I was, time I hear it, it's like, we. As I said, and mine, I was thinking, and. I was sitting here going, and, and, and. You and. know, there's, there's this great story where she, right? she pulled oh, a practical joke. Uh, I guess it was maybe about a week before we she came to shoot. Mm -hmm. And she called Alan's wife, Lisa, <coughs> on the phone. And who's also one of the producers of the film, and pretended to be script, as I remember, <laughs> pretended to be uh, 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 an agent, uh, very uh, a nasty agent, I, I believe. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Nasty. saying that Kate would not be able to arrive on the set on time to start shooting because something had come up, and and literally created this big turmoil. And then finally, about five minutes later, admitted that it was her trying out her American <laughs> accent. I called. I called back. Call can back you, and said, can oh, you remember me. that? What this conversation went like? <laughs> yeah, I can. I can completely remember because Just, Alan, yeah. Alan. Yeah, <laughs> was very nervous about my American accent, <laughs> and, and he was. He it was, was Universal uh, give it, giving me forty-five million dollars. Who were nervous? <laughs> very, very nervous. Like, could I do an American accent? Hello, I was American in Titanic. Yeah. Whatever. People yeah. seem to forget that. So, and of course, it's an actor's job to do a yeah. dialect, and I love nothing more than playing a character with a different voice because it, it it's more challenging, frankly. So I had been working very hard back in London um, with a dialect coach, Carla Meyer. Who who was wonderful, absolutely wonderful, on perfecting this particular accent, which is very different, admittedly, to the one that I did do in Titanic in the end. Um, and we'd had, a, we just had a really good day. We were working in Alan's offices, actually, in London, and um, we'd had a great day, and I was feeling, you know, kind of a bit kind of pleased with myself. And I said, <laughs> I said, come on, let's, let's, let's phone someone. You know, who can we phone? And she was like, and she's quite sort of soft-spoken, Carla, and she said, oh, Kate, you know, do you think we should? And I said, yeah, yeah, come on, come on, come on, who should we phone? I went, oh, let's phone Alan like this. <laughs> and she said, well, won't he be on set? And I said, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Let's just ring and we can leave a message or something. So I, I, I called his office and, and Lisa, Alan's wife and, and our producer, picked up the phone. And I suddenly thought, okay, okay, oh, I've done it. She's picked up, okay, I've got to do it now. Okay, you know, I, 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 the, 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 there's no getting out of this. So I just clicked into this thing and um, I pretended to be, as Kevin says, basically my agent um, calling to say that, you know, there was a big issue, you know, with, with the dates and everything and that really they had been a little bit sloppy in, uh, in letting, me, le letting us know um, what they had wanted from me and so frankly we were just changing the plans and this was the deal, which of course we would never do. So, um, so this was very kind of out of character and Lisa's on the end of the phone going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, 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 fine. And the phone goes dead and I went, oh my God, I think 
actually bored yet. Like, <laughs> and so five minutes, and I was like, shall I phone back yet? And then I phoned back, and I went, Lisa, did you just get a call from my agent's office? She was like, yeah, oh my God, that girl was so... And I said, it was me, and she went, you're kidding. And I said, no, it was me. Da, da, da. I was like, I was always with myself. I really was. Because when you can convince someone who you've spoken to before who, and who actually knows you, that is, that's encouraging, you know, so. Yeah. So, so you yes. knew you had it then? Yes. Well, I knew I, knew I was certainly getting it, that's for yeah. sure. She's actually never recovered, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. All right, let me take a look at another. This is a, where Laura prepares David uh, for the TV debate uh, with the governor of Texas talking about death penalty. Here it is. What do you hope the film accomplishes other than reaching a wide audience, yeah. being uh, good entertainment? Beyond that, well, you know, it's it's that, and obviously uh, that's what the studio would hope for. That's right. what all of us. Would okay, hope let's for. assume you reach that goal. What okay. else? Um, that within it is is an issue that. Uh, I don't believe that any movie, we only have two hours to communicate with people, so we can't change people's points of view about anything. And as uh, Kevin has, um, so has articulated with regards to muddled ambiguity, uh, <laughs> it's kind of, it doesn't really, <clears throat> it's not a diatribe with regards to, I'm, you know, I'm against it, the death penalty, obviously, and otherwise, you know. But I, it's, if I can have a film and at the end of it, the <clears throat> we create uh, or provoke debate so that people think about it and then make their minds up then I think that's that's an important thing to do because in the end it, that film is not a controversial film the issue is controversial yeah. and if people debate it then that's very valid and therefore we've not only uh, made an entertaining film but we yeah. actually and that's what art out do I believe in so. the end. Uh, was, uh, excuse me the thing that was that was so interesting about making this movie <clears throat> and what I really learned what I took away from it was you know I'm I, I, I'm well educated, you know, I thought I sort of was up on issues and all of that and I realized that with the most controversial issues, they tend, you tend to react to them emotionally. So your, your opinion is emotionally based. And what this allowed me to do was issues, they tend, you tend to react to them emotionally. So your, your opinion is emotionally based. And what this allowed me to do was I, with him, to really learn about it. You don't know the statistics, you don't know how it affects people, you don't go in depth. And then I've realized, much to my horror, that I'm very much like that on most issues. And, and so it's are most really, people. And so are mm -hmm. most people. Well, and it really, it was a lesson. Because it's a decidedly uncomfortable issue. You know, you don't see people reading, you know, every New York yeah. Times Magazine article on the death penalty from cover to cover. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, I, I discovered this, too, when I went to Africa and I came back, and, and I, 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 I noticed that there was a poll that was done. And maybe this is true with a lot of people about a lot of issues. And people were asked in this poll, do you think the U.S. government should give more money to Africa? And overwhelmingly, the answer is, no, we give too much. And then when you say, well, do you know how much we give? And then you actually give a figure, and then people go, "Oh, well, that's that, that's really not so much." <laughs> or why why this would be in our interest? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, I've I've now gone, uh, and Laura's gone, and Alan's gone, uh, and Kate's been working here in New York, so she hasn't been able to come on this college tour. That's, we've been I was going getting around, to that's where I was we've going. been going around right. the country, and we've done about I guess ten or twelve cities, and you know we do all the local press, you know, because that that's what Universal wants us to do. But the thing that's really great for us to do is this interaction that we get with college kids. And what you find is, because we do Q&As after they see the movie, and what you find is, you know, kids who are in college, you know, that kind of age, they're not as po about issues like polarized about issues like this. Mm. And so mm -hmm. it's a much more open discussion in which people are actually able to listen to each other. Mm -hmm. And we've had some really provocative yeah. and provocative conversations because very often in these kind of debates, whether it's gay rights or abortion or the death penalty, the second somebody hears what your position is, they stop listening to you. Yeah. Because you're they know the what your argument is yeah. and you're yeah. the enemy and they're just going to spend their time trying to convince the listener that yeah. you're wrong and they're right. Yeah, and, uh, <clears throat> let me just come to you. Uh, when you're telling your story here, mm -hmm. uh, how do you make sure you avoid the movie sounding like it's pedantic? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, <clears throat> I've sometimes been criticized for shouting too loudly because yes, of bad things. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you don't uh, shout. Huh? Not me, no, never. You very don't quiet. Shout. I'm, I'm he an, doesn't yeah. shout. No, <laughs> I don't shout, no. I'm a knight of the realm. I'm very well behaved. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, sir, Alan. The thing is, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> 
if you're too preachy, you lose the audience anyway. Yeah. And anyway, the most important thing is to, is to present our case this way and that way. Mm. For you, the audience, to think. I can't make you think, and neither should I make you think. Mm. What I want you to do is actually consider the differences of these people's point of view or that point of view for you to weigh up. So that in the car park or in the coffee shop afterwards, they talk about a movie. Mm. And most movies, people just forget the moment they throw the empty, you know, carton of popcorn right. and they walk out of the theatre, they forget the movie. If we can get them to talk about the issue, then the film has worked from a dramatic point of view and from a point of view of its polemics. There, yeah, also, it, there are a lot of human issues in this film as well. People sort of go right to the politics first because it's there, and I think it's sort of easier to go there for a lot of people. Mm. There's, there's the issue that runs through the film, at least, that I really responded to and loved, the whole sort of question of what do you do with your life? Mm. What are you using your life for? Mm. Mm. What is worthy? of your life, how or do you take any responsibility for that? And I think all of us, particularly since September 11th, everyone is sort of re-examining things. And it's the, it's the one thing that has really stuck with me. And, um, and there are other issues as well um, within it. So it's not... I mean, I really think, you know, just, just to go back to the question that you asked of Alan, that in, in, a, in a way, Alan couldn't have made a, a, a pedantic film because that wasn't in the script, you know, that wasn't in the writing of this, of this story and the telling of this tale. And, and that's what it is. That's what movies are. They're, they're, they're just story stories. Telling. Yeah. Right. Unless they're based on a true story, you know. This one actually isn't. It's based on tremendous amounts of fact, but our story, you know, it, it's fictional. Um, but this script was so highly, but this script was so highly skilled and well crafted and brilliantly written and the responsibility that that I felt to see this story through her eyes yeah, that's what I, that's and why she has said. to she has to grab them she has to grab them she has to run with them and she has to take them through the thriller element of this movie they have to be going through her they experience. have to be going through her experience yeah, right. you know and they have to want to save this man's life as much as she does and it's really that that drives the thriller element of the movie up until the end and and I, when I sat and watched it for the first time you know I'm in it and I, I was uh, I was so gripped I was gripped and uh, you know I, I'm the person playing this playing this character and I'm like go on go on go on <laughs> you know it really does get you in that way so it was really the brilliance of the writing that we were all blessed by um, mm. that 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 certainly helped tremendously certainly for, for us as actors I know in, in 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 the making of this of this film it also should be noted sorry yeah. it should be noted that don't forget that her job was very hard mm -hmm. because you got to see all of the flashbacks right. that, of mm -hmm. David Gale's right. life. Right. She didn't. Mm. She had to imagine yeah. all of that. Yeah. And her emotional investment yeah. and how it changed her and how mm -hmm. it made her shift, you know, she is, uh, in, a, in essence, the audience. Right. You know, she's mm -hmm. that function of the role. And it was remarkable how much, you know, when we'd come back and we'd start shooting another scene, and then when I saw how Alan put the whole thing together, I was just like, it's like she was there. And I mean, in a weird way, mm -hmm. although you two had no scenes together, mm -hmm. there's this triangle between the three characters in the film. Yeah. And that's partly his skill, mm -hmm. but it's also about that emotional investment. I it's should probably say this. Why is this capital punishment, anti-capital punishment, anti-death penalty advocate in jail? Oh, why he's in jail? Yeah. Oh, because in the course of the film, uh, he, he is accused of a crime which you see, and therefore you know if he's innocent or guilty. And later in the film, <coughs> he is accused of a murder, which you do not see, and therefore the film operates in a way that you do not know whether he's guilty or innocent. And therefore, like Kate's character, the audience is consistently being forced to shift their point of view, to reassess how they feel about him. Is he guilty? Is he innocent? And it really doesn't ravel itself out until uh, almost the very end of the film. It's one of the best parts I've ever had. Yeah. Me too. Thanks. I mean, and, and yeah, I've got yeah. to say that when I first read this script, the politics were just a context for me. Mm. I mean, I know that for Alan it was the most, you know, it was a, the core of it, but it certainly wasn't for me when I first read it. Mm. And I, you know, it was a, a sort of a... I, you know, I became more and more involved in that in that side of the movie, but r really for me, the, it's the other stuff that, mm. you know, that that really, you know, the quality of it is just the, what we all got to play. The, the many dimensions yeah. that we got to play, you know, were, was just challenging and terrific. Mm. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Thank Thank you for you. coming here. Pleasure. Thank Great you to very see much. you. Thanks. We'll be right back. Stay with us. <laughs>